Good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new sermon series Sunday. This is Sunday, July 12th, and our new sermon series is on 2 Corinthians. So buckle up, friends. We are headed on a new journey. It is great to see everybody once again. And of course, here are my normal morning announcements. Please have available your lighter and your candle so when the time comes, we can light our Christ candle together. Friends, we worship together. And now prepare your hearts and your minds for just that, to worship the one true God. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to worship. The light of Christ brightens our day, just as the pillar of fire led the way through the wilderness. God leads us with God's light. We light our candle to symbolize Christ's presence with us, God's presence with us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God's light overcomes all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Blessed be God who carries our griefs. God, God longs for God's, God's people to find consolation within our community. Blessed be God who binds us together. Bound by the Holy Spirit, our burdens are lightened and our joys are heightened. You, Lord, are the hope of all the ends of the earth. And of the farthest seas. We shall be satisfied. There's that word again. We shall be satisfied and content with the goodness of your presence. God, God draws, draws near to all flesh, flesh and, and answers, answers prayer. prayer. Blessed be God who gives us with peace. And, and is, is the joy of, of our salvation. salvation. Let us pray. Indeed, Holy One, you are the joy of our salvation. We thank you and praise you that in all times you are near and that when we are having times of struggle and tension in our personal relationships within our community, that you draw near to us as individuals and amongst us as a group. Holy One, we are here by technology as your people. You bind us together by your spirit and you inhabit this space. We pray, Lord, that you would hear your praises, you would receive them, and that you would be pleased with what you hear. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You lead me. 
to mercy And nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, oh God Indeed, friends, God's grace is enough for us to cover the multitude of our sins. We have a part in that transaction, if you will. God's grace is enough. Our part is to lay down those sins and allow God's grace to cover us. We do have that opportunity every day of our lives to reconnect with God when we fall away. It is a blessing to be able to do this together in community. So let's join together with our prayer of confession for today. The words will be on your screen. Let us pray. When our path becomes difficult, we do not always turn to you. We look for an easy way out. We escape in avoidance and find other means to soothe ourselves. We forget your promise and seek what does not satisfy. Forgive us and bring us back into the strength of your spirit. In Jesus' strong name we pray, amen. And now I invite you to a time of contemplative confession. Hear these words of assurance, children of God. Our baptism is sure. And the promise remains strong, as strong enough, as strong as God's grace, as wide carrying, wide reaching as God's grace, friends. We are God's own. And whenever we confess, God not only listens and hears, but responds and forgives and removes our sins from us. Children of God, you have laid down your sins 
and God has forgiven you. You have been restored. Thanks be to God. Amen? Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. God of mercy, you promise never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change. Then we may respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The first scripture reading is Psalm 65, verses 1 through 2 and 9 through 13. Listen as the Holy Spirit speaks to us from God's word. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you who answers prayer, to you all flesh shall come of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty, your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hill girds themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks, the valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Listen for the word of the Lord. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, including all the saints throughout Achaia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation, who consoles us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to console those who are in any affliction with the consolation with which we ourselves are consoled by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are abundant for us, so also our consolation is abundant through Christ. If we are being afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation. If we are being consoled, it is for your consolation, for which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we also are suffering. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our suffering, so also you share in our consolation. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death so that we would rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He who rescued us from so deadly a peril will continue to rescue us. On him we have set our hope that we, he will rescue us again as you also join in helping us by your prayers, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, kindle in us the fire of your love. Open us fully to what it is you have to say to the church today. And may the thoughts of our minds and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you alone are our rock and our redeemer. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Author Jen Hatmacher 
at one time was very much a darling of what she says is the white evangelical women's culture. She said it was a, it's a niche, it is, but she was succeeding in it greatly. She had written books, and they had sold very well. And she had come to a point where she was a well-sought-after speaker for different conferences and workshops. She had built an entire ministry, she says, and a whole career. And this was all to come to a halt when she did an interview with Religion News Service in 2016, and she expressed support for the LGBTQ community. It was in an interview, and not too shortly after that interview was released, Lifeway Christian Stores made an announcement that it would be pulling all of her books and all of the videos that had her in it off of their shelves. The thing about that community, she says, is that the currency is belonging. When you are following the rules, their rules, when you are hitting all the marks, their marks, when you are staying inside the lines, their lines, you are rewarded. And your reward is that you get to be a part of it. You get to belong. You get to stay centered. But belonging is also used as a punishment. And so when you step outside of any of those lines, when you question, when you push, and when you challenge your belonging is the first thing that is revoked. And I knew it, she said. I knew how the game works because I'd seen it happen to other people. She lost her belonging, and she was expelled from the Christian community of which she had become a darling. Jen Hetmaker is a mother of five, including two sons who are now ages 21 and 17, who were born in Ethiopia. She says that she is spoken, outspoken against racism, and she is a strong supporter of the Black Lives Matter moment, movement. She says, in great sorrow, she and her husband have sat down to talk with their sons about what millions of black parents have had with their sons on how to walk and talk and respond to a police officer. She said, it just terrifies me for my family and for all moms and dads who are sending their black kids out into the world. See, before she started speaking up about love and justice for the career community, about justice and inclusion and love and anti-racism for the entire African-American community as an ally, she was a darling. And then she spoke up. She challenged the church, and the rocky relationship began to the point of it kicking her out. Hang on to that. Welcome to a new sermon series, friends. We are now journeying with Paul again, and we are now in 2 Corinthians. You might remember that right after Easter, we were in 1 Corinthians. And a little bit of time has passed. We are thinking that 1 Corinthians was written between 56 and 57, and so this likely this letter was written in about the year 57. And what's important for us to remember is 2 Corinthians is not literally the second letter to the Corinthians that Paul wrote. This, what we call the book of 2 Corinthians, mostly like an amalgamation of several letters. And there's one particularly that got lost, and it was written before the one that we are reading out of now. And there are also several that are woven into, and there are bits and pieces, scholars think, that are into what we call 2 Corinthians. And the situation of what is going on is false prophets, as Paul calls them, have entered into Corinth. And not only are they saying things differently about what we would now name the Christian gospel, Christian theology, the message of the way of Jesus Christ, they are going also another step and challenging Paul's apostolic authority. His relationship 
with the Corinthians is rocky in what we are reading today. Although, and this is important, as it says in our reading for today, his hope in them remains unshaken. So the letter that was written before what we start reading today was one that Paul says that he wrote with out of much distress and anguish of heart and with many tears. This is in chapter 2, verse 4. See, what had happened is his friend Timothy, who is with him as he is dictating what we now call the first part of 2 Corinthians, Timothy had visited, had visited Corinth, and he had gone to Ephesus to tell Paul what was going on, and Paul was greatly disturbed. And so he made a visit to Corinth, and the visit did not go well. And so he goes back to Ephesus, and in the ways that he was trying to talk to the church and try to get them back and try to work on their relationship, he did not do very well in person. When he came back, he wrote the letter with tears that ended up being more of a smackdown, scholars think, and it did not go well. So within the beginning here, we notice that there is one word and the various forms of it that is repeated several times over. Paul is writing, as he says, in a spirit of consolation. Now, we know that his mind is a little agitated, not only because he talks about what is going on between him and the Corinthians, but because the form of the letter is a little bit different. Normally, right after he does the greeting and he says who he is, who he's writing to, and he does his little salutation, grace and peace, he goes into a thanksgiving. This time he does not go into a thanksgiving, but he does a blessing of God, a blessing of God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all consolation. And scholars say that a better translation of this word actually is encouraging. The Greek word here is paraklesis, and it means upbuilding, strengthening, encouraging. So the use of this word reflects that Paul's desire is to overcome the kind of shattering of a relationship that has happened and that has taken place. There's been a shattering of a relationship between a Christian teacher and the Christian community. Does that sound a little bit familiar? Is what had happened between Miss Hatmacker and it had happened with other authors that had had the strength to stand up for what they understood. There's tension between a Christian teacher and between the Christian community. That's the part of where we are within 2 Corinthians today. Now, the blessing that he gives to God is a central theme within the Old Testament, within Hebrew Scripture. And this blessing is very important because it sets the stage. This is a blessing that says that God saves and liberates us from whatever is oppressing us so that we can be of service to others. In the words of Hebrew scholar, scholar John Levinson, he says that the chosen are called to serve. And in this blessing, we find a practical understanding of God's response to evil, sin, and suffering. And that is this. It creates a basis for a distinct kind of overflow of reciprocity. It creates a basis for a distinct kind of overflow of reciprocity. Going back and forth, there's a sharing going on. And Paul talks about that right at the beginning of the letter this passes Ernest Best, who writes the interpretation commentary on 2 Corinthians, says is of one particular theme. It is of Christian suffering. And he says that it's important not to apply the suffering that Paul talks about and the affliction that he talks about. It's important not to apply that to any 
other type of affliction that we can suffer within our daily lives. We have to keep it within its context. And because it is specifically talking to the church about what is going on with the church, that means that through this text, the Holy Spirit speaks to the church today. Paul is speaking mano a mano, if you will, as one who has suffered because he's a Christian to others, to the Corinthians who have suffered because they are a Christian. During that time, the Corinthians may have suffered with riots that are against them and their beliefs that they would have literally, like physically have gotten dragged into. They would have suffered by false accusations in court, even imprisonment, and also their homes and their businesses would have been broken up because they are Christians, because they dared to separate themselves from the Roman imperial religion or from Judaism, or from whatever relation, whatever religion they were, they were practicing at the time that fit well within the Pax Romana. They are taking this bold step, not only to proclaim Christ Jesus as Lord and not Caesar, but also to worship a man that the Romans had executed in the most humbling and awful of ways. And they are getting persecuted for it. And Paul says, I get you. Now, what's interesting uh, within this context of talking about this suffering is Paul never wrote about the problem of human suffering, Ernest Best tells us, nor did he ever become embittered about what happened to him. So everything that we just talked about within the book of Job about the problem of human suffering and where is God in this? Is God responsible for it? All of those questions, Paul never writes about them at all because he knew that his sufferings were unavoidable because he had no option to follow Christ and to preach him because of the call on his life, because of what happened to him on the road to Damascus when he was blinded by the light and when he heard the voice of the one true Savior, I am Jesus. Why are you persecuting me? And he knew that suffering was part of what he was doing because, well, Jesus had promised it to his disciples. We hear Jesus say in the Gospel of John, I will tell you that the world, in the world, you will face persecution, but take courage, for I have overcome the world. So, what about this? this encouragement, this consolation. Well, that's kind of the flip side of this same coin within this text. Because comforting is not a removal of the suffering in this context, nor is it the assurance that everything is going to be okay, that it will turn out fine in the end, nor that others have suffered worse things than you are, or not even that it will soon be over. Paul puts this suffering and even this encouragement in this context, in the frame of salvation. Comfort comes in knowing Christ better, in being more firmly united with him as dead, buried, and risen and thereby knowing better or being more firmly united with Christ in his body, literally the body of Christ, the Christian community. See, friends, there is community in suffering and comfort. People who in their previous ordinary lives and might have paid little attention to one another suddenly find themselves helping and supporting others and being helped and supported. I can tell you, that when I went to the rally, to the Stand Firm, We Are Hungry for Change rally in Plano last month, that that was true. I had never met anyone, and yet they felt like friends that I had never had, had for a long time. We had something in common. We were able to comfort one another through the tension and the strain and the uprising that was going on in our community. 
Now what happens is within our culture today, our attitude towards suffering is that it is individual. And we see suffering um, as something that purifies us and refines us, refines our own soul. But what's interesting within this text, and even within Paul and the way that he writes throughout all of our readings, is that for Paul, it purifies and sustains the entire body of Christ. It pulls them all together. It pulls us all together. Remember, he is writing as one who has suffered because he is a Christian and he is preaching Christ. And he is speaking to those who have suffered because they are worshiping and following Christ. He's speaking to the church. And as this passage specifically speaks to the church, it speaks to us today as we are struggling and as we have affliction within what is going on with our culture and our communities today. Our church is being called out as a body and it's telling us to be encouraged, this text is, and it's telling us to dig in. On June 2nd, an article was released on the Presbyterian Mission website, and it was reporting of comments that our stated clerk of the Presbyterian Church USA, Reverend Dr. Herbert Nelson, had made during a webinar. And Clerk Nelson made it very clear to Presbyterian churches throughout this country and the world. He said, no longer can we hide behind not being controversial. Let me say that one more time. No longer can we hide between, behind not being controversial, Clerk Nelson says. He says, we all are caught in this quagmire now because the injustice of one of God's children who suffers, the injustice of one of the communities within God's creation suffers, within the context of what Paul is saying and is speaking to the church today, is if one of us suffers, all of us suffer. And whenever we suffer together, we are able to come and comfort one another together in the understanding of what it feels like to suffer and the understanding of what it feels like to be able to walk together through that challenge. It is speaking to the church Clerk continues, and he said, the church is being called to dismantle structures that put God's people in poverty and pain. And to not only are we called to share the gospel and the good news, we are call being called to share ourselves in this time, in this time of upheaval, where if there is pain that is being felt by one part of God's children, one part of God's creation. We all feel it together, mano a mano, talking to one another, understanding as a part of God's creation who has suffered, who has been challenged, who maybe has been kicked out of a community because of being a Christian and speaking up for the justice of all of God's children, we are talking together and able to be together and relate to one another, not just in our suffering, but the way that we can communicate. We are closer to Christ. As a member of Christ's body, we become closer to one another. Ernest Best continues and he says, how can we grasp the way that comfort and encouragement flows from one body to another, the body of Christ as a whole, and from one body of one person to another, one body of believers, one part of Christianity to another? How does that happen? And Ernest Best says this, perhaps we shall only understand it in our own lives when we take our faith more seriously, when we allow it to disturb us more deeply. 
Then we will know a greater fellowship with others as we support them, share with them in the comfort we receive with God and participate in the comfort that they receive from God. Like Paul, like Jen Hatmacker, and like the many who have challenged the church in this times of strife, the church today is being called to deal with what is challenging us in these times. In these times, with the virus, with all of the social justice challenges that are going on, we're called to face it head on. Just as Paul is doing this, after he has been to Corinth, visited the people, and even written a letter with tears. He is coming back, and he is bringing words of consolation, of the encouragement of the community within the understanding that they have suffered together. This word of encouragement is a way of affirming the gospel message that Paul is talking about the God who has risen Jesus from the dead. Whatever the conflict is, it is extremely secondary to what God has done. Human conflict, says workingpreacher.com, human conflict has led to Jesus' crucifixion. And in Jesus' resurrection and ascension, God claims profoundly that human conflict will not set the terms for the future. This stands over and against the damage that human beings have done and will continue to do together. Church, this is our moment. No longer can we stand behind being safe. We preach the gospel. We preach the good news that it brings, and we preach the truth of its justice. And then we go out, and we share in the sufferings, and we share in the encouragement and the comfort to make a change in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the holy name of the one who was, who is, and who is yet to come. Amen. I want to remind you once again, friends, that every Wednesday we have our Zoom prayer gathering. First of all, you are welcome to join us. It's at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. Now, maybe you're thinking, I work during the day. Are you kidding me? Well, perhaps you might be able to take a break for a short period of time and join us. And also another invitation, please continue to send us your prayer requests. We have been receiving them and we even had the joy of being able to take some off of our prayer list because the answers have come. So let us now spend some time in prayer together and we will end it with the Lord's Prayer and the words for that will be on your screen. Let us pray. God of all mercy, comfort, upbuilding, and consolation. You are with us no matter what we are doing here on earth. Sometimes we are doing well and we are praising you. Sometimes we are doing not so well and we are hurting each other and we are hurting you and we are giving a bad name to your body, the church. Thank you, Holy One, that whenever we come to you, you forgive us. You are the father in the prodigal son story, that whenever we come back and we need your comfort, you gird up your loins and you run towards us and you welcome us into your arms with love and compassion and joy. Holy God, our continuing search of you through these times it's not ending. We know that you are there. We know that you are powerful. We know that you are in control of all things. We don't understand everything. So we pray once again, and we know that you are hearing, Lord, that you would come and you would bring healing and you would bring an end to this pandemic. 
that we would stop spreading it, that those who are in harm's way, who are taking care of those who are sick, whether be it be at home, in doctor's offices, or at hospitals, in whatever capacity that they are serving, that you would protect them, Holy God. We pray, Holy One, for those who are grieving, who those who have passed away, whether it is from the virus or from other complications. Lord, we pray that you would be with those who are suffering, who are at their own houses, because there is a rise in domestic violence. There is a rise in suicide attempts. attempts. There is a rise, Lord, in fear and anxiety. Lord, we pray that even though the school the riots and the rallies and the constant news of things that are going on with the Black Lives Matter movement might not be in the, in the news constantly, Lord. It seems to have quieted down, whatever that means. Lord, help us not to forget you have called your church. Holy One, remind us that we are a community. In what we suffer we are together and we are able to comfort one another because of our sufferings, through our sufferings, through your Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, it is because of what you took upon yourself, our humanity, of your work upon the cross, and because of the joy and the consolation and the comfort that comes from your resurrection that we are able to experience this. We thank you and we praise you. And we pray that you would hear all of us as we join together in saying the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for are yours forever and ever. Amen. Once again, friends, we are grateful for your generosity as you continue to give to the mission of this church. Whether you are a member or not, we thank you for your gifts. Our button to give online still works, as does sending checks directly to our church through the P.O. box or even working out a system through your bank that they send checks directly. Whatever way you have chosen, we are grateful and we continue to give glory to God as we serve our call here in East Plano.
Indeed, friends, God is our firm foundation and the Lord will never forsake us. Whether we are feeling like we're suffering and we're feeling afflicted, or we are feeling comfort from God, from the Christian community, from all of, all of community, from God's body, God is with us. And as we go out into our week with God in front of us, behind us, on the side, let's say together our commission and blessing. The words will be on the screen. Blessed be God who knows all our sufferings. As the Lord is one who knows suffering firsthand. So that when we suffer, we find consolation within bonds of love. And when we are weary, our spirits are lifted by those who care. Blessed be God who knows that the many are stronger than the few. And that burdens divided amongst the community are lighter in weight. Because of this God, through all our lives, we belong to God and to one another. Indeed, we belong to God and to one another. We are bound together by the power of the Holy Spirit and receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of that Holy Spirit be with you today and always. Go in peace, beloved of the Lord, and serve God. Amen. Amen.